Hey guys, almost Thanksgiving time. Are you excited? I am. I'm ready to eat a super low carb Thanksgiving dinner. That's just the way I roll. But you guys can eat whatever carbs you want. I'm not a hater. Today, let's talk a little bit about sponsorship. Speakeasy Leather. Speakeasy Leather has some of the best leather in the game, whether it is wallets or key uh, key fobs or knife holders, whatever you need, they've got it for you. Check them out at speakeasyleather.com. Look cool, look sharp, make sure your leather goods are on point. Use the code SAVAGE, all caps, at checkout for 15% off. We are about a month away from Justin Rohde's Jolly Big Throws Clinic at Youngstown State University. You want to get on him right now and get your spot available, whether it's for you or your student athlete. He's got a fantastic program, and he's going to have some of the best coaches in the country there helping out. Check him out at roadiesport.com. While you're there, pick up a shot put glove, maybe a wrist wrap for your throwers out there, and check out his closed loop lifting straps. Very sharp and very, very sturdy. Roadiesport.com. Use the code SAVAGE SPORT, all one word, all caps, at checkout for, I think it's 10% off. Check him out. Iron and Stone Strength, Iron and Stone up in the Buffalo, New York area. They have the coolest gym up there. Uh, super, super hardcore, strong man, but it's a big family, and they look like they have a lot of fun, and they're putting out some great athletes. You want to check these guys out while you're there. Look, their gear is awesome. You guys are getting a free fucking podcast twice a week. Twice a week, all I'm asking you to do is go there and buy a cool t-shirt from them because their t-shirts are sharp as hell. I love them, and I know you guys will too, and they're super comfy. I lift in them. I go out to dinner in them. I go to church with them. I'd have a meeting in the Pope with these t-shirts on. They're super, super fashionable, and I love them. Give them a holler. Ironandstonestrength.com. Use the code REFINESAVAGE at checkout for 20% off. Stay classy meats. The best meat delivery service in the game. They are doing it up in Bozeman, Montana. I'm a huge fan. I have been fully fueled on Stay Classy Meats since June of this year. And I tell you what, if you're not out there in the wilderness hunting your own game, you should be getting your meat from Stay Classy Meats because I can vouch for where this stuff comes from. Small batch farms where the animals are humanely treated. They're living their best life. They're humanely processed. There's no hormones involved. They're doing it right. And you can taste it in the meat. It's just way better than anything else I've ever tasted. Try that bison, man. It is out of control. Go over to stateclassymeats.com. Pick out your box. Use the code SAVAGE at checkout for 10% off. If you are trying to equip any kind of gym that you can think of, whether it's a little garage gym all the way up to a big commercial gym. Serious Steel is the way to go. They are fantastic. The customer service is fantastic. The products are fantastic. Just great people doing a really good job. They have everything you could possibly need. I just got a pair of knee sleeves from them. They're out of this world. Super thick and supportive. I I, I couldn't say enough about them. I use them in jujitsu. And uh, they are just really, really helpful. Keep those knees super warm. SeriousDeal.com. Use the code SAVAGE at checkout for 10% off. Warrior CBD. There are so many CBD oil companies out there today. And you're going to see, like, I think it's there's going to be, like, a CBD oil bubble bursting here soon where some of these companies are going to fall by the wayside. One that will be around long after the other ones are gone is Warrior CBD. I know that because the stuff works. The customer service is fantastic. And they've got real athletes testing and trying this stuff out. Warrior CBD, check them out on Instagram. If you have questions, get a hold of Nancy on their Instagram page. She will answer your questions for you. In the meantime, check out warriorcbdofficial.com. Use that code WARRIOR20 off at checkout. Cerberus Strength, man. I keep seeing more and more people with Cerberus gear on, and I can't be happier for that. I'm hoping that the show is being a big part of that. Very cool to see. Cerberus-strength.us. They have everything you need. Wraps and straps, belts and shirts, smelling salts, sandbags, tacky. They've got it all. You'll spend a week and a half just going through their site and looking at cool stuff. So, like I said, Cerberus-strength.us. 
Use the code REFINESAVAGE10 at checkout. Finally, today, Evan Armstrong brewing the best coffee around. Store-bought coffee is garbage. Evan has got it down to a science. Viking Coffee Co. I personally love the Old Man Strength Coffee. That's my brand. You know, I... I don't know why you wouldn't buy at least one bag while you're there buying everything else he's got on the shelves. Check it out. Use the code VIKINGCOFFEE10 at checkout for 10% off at vikingcoffeecode.com. Today on the show, throws coach, Walsh University. Second time on the podcast, Jeff Giacomides. His first podcast with us, we had some technical issues, and you could hear about 30% of it. You know how those early episodes were. Now you can't uh, help but hear me screaming at you through this microphone. So today on the show, Jeff Giacomides, we talked all things throwing and fitness-related. Really good podcast. Really interesting. Enjoy this, and enjoy your Thanksgiving day, motherfuckers. I love you all. Let's talk soon. See ya at the end. Jeff, <laughs> thanks for coming. Thanks for doing this again. Absolutely. I Only wanted to... Time, uh, but yeah. Pull this uh, right up close, so it's, it's on a swivel there, so you can, and then it might fall off. But um, I wanted to do this again, number one, because it was a great conversation last time. But we had some kind of technical difficulties last time; we could barely hear the podcast. So, oh, yeah. I wanted to get you back in and <laughs> do it right this time. What's been going on? How's life at Walsh? Same old, same old. Good. I was just telling Zach out there, it's a real different year for me. Um, you know, last year. Well, every year I, I have about 20 to 25 throwers mainly, but last year I graduated in my first recruiting class, so I have 10 new ones out of 20, so personalities are, are a lot different this year. Right. Um, a lot of young, had two transfers come in, so it's uh, it's just a very different group. So I, I still got two, two fifth-year seniors that I brought in as freshmen, mm-hmm. And then one girl that uh, is a fifth-year senior who went to Tri C before coming into Walsh. So I've got some some old dogs, but it's it's mainly a lot of young this year. So yeah. it's just figuring out these these new ones. But reload good. a little bit and yeah. figure out personalities and yeah. Um, what uh, anyone standing out right off the bat that uh, is new that you're thinking? We've got a lot of talent. I mean, this is this is the best talent-wise women's group I've ever brought in. Um, we somehow managed to land three girls coming in over 130 feet in the discus, which is probably they were probably all three top ten in Ohio in wow. this last senior class. So, um, a lot of talent, a lot of athleticism on the women's side. On the men's side, we got some good guys, but they're more grunt, hardworking guys that are coming in with quite the marks that the women did Mm -hmm. um but they're they're all buying in really well and and hard working and and there's going to be a lot of success out of the group i'm i'm excited even the ones that were real under the radar or are taking the things real nice yeah it's it's fun throwing all the new ones into the hammer so it'll be a long-term game on some of them more than others but good group yeah are you able to recruit very many out of that Mm -hmm. um uh, the weight throwers in Ohio. I mean, do you even because a lot of them I know. Yeah, great. You you've got a great weight thrower in high school, but you know who's teaching you, and yeah. it's hard to tell who's good and who isn't, right? Yeah, I mean, if you go to the indoor state meet, it's amazing the technique techniques you see there. That yeah, it's, uh, hard to watch at times. But weight throw, hammer throw. I mean, I don't recruit it. Uh, a ton directly um i did bring in one guy this year who had thrown it to more significance um out of hilliard okay um he had gone 160 plus in the hammer out of high school um mike cornathan is his name so he's my one that's probably coming in with the most hammer experience that i've ever recruited i mean that was his primary event Mm -hmm. Um, but he backed it up with a I think he ended up going about 56 feet in the shot. So Wow. We're, I'm excited about him. Um, Dominic Nutter is another one who had thrown some weight indoors in high school, just very sparingly. He came from a real small school. I think he told me he graduated with like 25. So yeah. if, if you're graduating with that many, you can imagine there's probably not a lot of coaching and everything yeah. done. I think his mom actually had helped him out a little bit with it. But uh, just a lot of 
underdeveloped on the technique aspect of things. Yeah. Um, and as long as I guess they don't learn too many bad yeah, habits, right. you're I good mean, to go. Everyone we've had through Walsh, and I've, I've lost track of how many national qualifiers we've had in the hammer and weight specifically, I've only had one girl come in with significant experience in it. She was uh, out of Cuyahoga Falls. I mm-hmm. think she'd thrown it for maybe a year or two, um, but that's been it. So, what do you think about uh, kids throwing hammer and, and weight in high school? And Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? I mean, without the coaching, are we doing them a disservice by having them do it, you know? Hammer, I don't worry about as much. I think it's good to get some, some experience in. Right. I watch some of these kids throwing the weight in high school, and I'm just blows my mind there aren't more injuries. Yeah. You yeah. know, I watched, was on Instagram the other day, and, Saw, man, I mean, he's probably one of the top kids in Ohio throwing the weight. And, my God, I don't know how he's going to make it through the season if he keeps throwing like that. Yeah. I'm um, just going to rip something off of his body. But, so, I mean, it, it gives me my concern about it. But, honestly, you don't hear about a ton of dramatic injuries. Right. You really listen. But then, again, you probably only are going to hear about your top-level kids who are going to be – recovering and in a better situation anyway so yeah it's something i think about a lot with with uh high school kids you know my, my son is uh working with zach in the weight and doing really well but it was funny he went to uh he went to his high school throws coach and said hey you know i want to throw the weight this year and yeah. uh they were like well we don't we don't do that and he's like, well, you don't have to do it. You know, I've, I've got people coaching me. I just want you to sign me up for the meets. And they couldn't figure that out. And he's yeah. like, look, I'll have it. You know, yeah. I, it's covered. Just put, yeah, just you know, put me in the, beside my name. Right. And we're good. So I don't know if that, that will work. Uh, if him just tell her if I'm going to have to go in and, and explain to him that, you know, yeah. we've got this covered. But, you know, I, I got to buy him a weight. And, you know, those aren't cheap. And, oh, right. you know, it's, it would be nice that, uh, if it is a sanctioned sport, they actually take care of it and, yeah. and pay attention to it, you know? Yeah, it, it's it's tough, especially stuff like that. But, I mean, if you look around, how many kids never get to rotate in high school because they don't, yeah. the coach doesn't know it. Yep, so yep. They'd be terrified of throwing around a 20, 25-pound weight. And plus, it's indoor. And right. And then you're talking about different facilities uh, at the schools and everything. So, I don't know. That's a tricky situation there yeah. at the high school level. I mean, I... My first two years coaching college, I made four grand total. So it's not like they're going to shell out a bunch of money into a throws coach. Uh, yeah. And if they're not shelling it into the coach, they aren't going to put it into facilities at a lot of places. I remember uh, going for my one and only uh, interview as a as a track coach for a college, and I went and, and uh, interviewed for the Baldwin Wallace job years ago. And I was at the time I was. Uh, the throws coach at Amherst High School, and they sat me down. I went to the interview, and I think I did really well in it. And uh, came to pay, and they were paying less than the high school job that I was at. That was literally, I walked across my backyard to get to the rings, and I was like, "Yeah, I don't think I want it that bad." You know, yeah. I mean, it's a it's a tough pill to swallow. I mean, my I think it was my junior year at Ashland. I had a red shirt. I had my Third knee surgery, so I redshirted the whole year. So I coached um, Ashland Middle School, uh, coaching the long jump. I had like 26 kids trying yeah. the long jump. Um, and I made 2600 bucks doing that. I was like, man, right. I'm it's not a bad gig. Not bad. And then, uh, <laughs> first college job, I uh, no, we can get you paid as an official uh, at our home meets. But that was it. See, and it's such bullshit because most of these, you know, division, at least of the division three schools are charging you Oh, yeah. forty, fifty thousand dollar a year yeah. tuition, you know? Yeah. It's I don't know where the money goes, but it, it, it they, doesn't go into the hands of the throws pockets, coaches, so. right? Yeah, might might be different uh for the football team, but uh yeah. it's, you're sure not making that throw and that's that's for sure. But I think that's uh I'm sure that's you knew where that where where that was going. Oh when, yeah, yeah. Oh that's that's why I do the PTA on the side. Right. So. You still doing that? Yep, still doing that. Uh I can't can't say I've cut down at all. It'll be uh, interesting to see where things shake up. There was a lot of um, changes with laws and reimbursements just came out in October. Um, there's probably some more stuff coming out in January that everybody's kind of shaking in their boots worrying about. I know 
one of the things they're looking at in January is um, changing reimbursement to if it's done by a doctorate of physical therapy, they're getting full reimbursement. But if it's done by a physical therapist assistant, which is what I am, it's going to be 15% less. Whoa. So that's going to, if that goes through, that'll probably dramatically change things. Um, but uh, they're, they're fighting that pretty good. But yeah. That one's kind of flown under the radar somehow. I had a student observing me prior to her getting into PTA school, um, and she brought that to my attention, asking me, like, hey, what do I need to know about this? Oh, I'm like, no. what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> so oh, no. It'll be um, interesting to see, because just in October, they started doing more group therapy. Right. Um, which was a thing that was real big in the past. You know, you'd get your... Um, get all your patients down to the gym and you'd have them all kind of doing some big, you know, everything, buddy working on kind of the same thing, mm -hmm. you know, you'd hear about like, you know, get all your patients standing up and doing balloon and volleyball, you know, at the nursing home. Right. Uh, and that kind of went by the wayside for a while, but just in October, they basically want every patient 20 to 25% of their therapy to be within a group now. So hmm. That's going to change things a lot, too. I mean, uh, I heard about a lot of facilities uh, kind of freaking out and firing a bunch of people right away. So I'm just waiting to see what will happen. I mean, I'm right. one of the few that actually works on Sundays, so I've got some job security right. there because nobody wants to do that. But it'll be interesting to see how things shake out in the next, next year with uh, therapy in general. Yeah, they're always bringing in, you know, these regular – like I know NSCA is – I had heard that uh, – I, I listened to a podcast with Dave Tate talking to one of the strength coaches at Ohio State. And I guess he was saying that there's a push now that they might have to um, submit their programs to make sure they're, I they're know. I don't know, with the, you know, not dangerous, I guess, would be the, yeah. the, uh, I mean, it's, it's such it's a always, society it's, of covering your ass. Right, and it's always dangerous when uh, any kind of governing body gets involved with anything you're doing, it's, you know? it's You're almost so handcuffed anymore. Yeah, a little more. Oh, so we'll, I'm always breaking this thing. There we go. That'll work. Yeah, just as long as it's close. Yeah. Fixing the microphones here, folks. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it's such a culture of just rather than being ambitious and going after things of more of I can't do the wrong thing. Um, you know, they they just came out this year. You know, you're not allowed to use um, um, physical activity as a form of punishment anymore uh, yeah. at the college level, which... So, what, like, if someone mouths off on the football team, they can't yeah. make them run around the bleachers nope, or whatever. No, nope. oh, I mean, I remember my, my guy that was a national champ, when he was a freshman, he, like, overslept and was late to practice. I had a big stack of center blocks. I made him, you know, farmer's walk, pinch grip, center blocks. There's probably 30 of them out into the sector, build me a pyramid and bring them all back to right. pinch grip. Right. And then try and throw hammer after doing sure. all that pinch grip work. Um, can't get away with that anymore uh, unless I make the whole team do it and make it a conditioning workout. So, uh, you, you know, it's just uh, like, come on, let's. We just had, uh, matter of fact, the podcast dropped today, whenever this is coming out. We had uh, Ryan Jasinski on the podcast, and he was a, a member of SEAL Team 10. And it was it, listening to him talk about buds and having to go through all that. And when you go through buds, you know, you're not a seal when you get out of buds. It, all it is is them fucking with you to yeah. make you harder and to get rid of the people who aren't right, did, don't want it enough. Yeah. And he looked back at it and he was giggling the whole time he was telling me the stories, you know. And it's like there is no uh, psychological problems with this guy because he went through some hard, you know, a week's worth of hell yeah. at age 19. You know, the, nothing bad happened to him. He just learned to deal with things and. And got mentally tough, and and uh, it weeded out the people you don't want there to begin with, you know. Yeah. And that's where, like, I don't know. So there, there's not enough pushing the envelope on dealing with situations 
to, you know, if you don't challenge people, then what happens when they don't have a choice but to be challenged? Yeah. That's what I mean. And, I, you know, I just said how I have a group of a lot younger this year. Um, and, you know, there's – it's – a very different mentality with things you know this is um just in general it's a lot more of having to ask permission to do anything and just very different there's not a lot of go get it and you know handle your crap and yeah you know it's it's a lot very different personality than i'm used to and you know aspects of it are good um but aspects of it are kind of alarming to look at and think you know how how would this person deal with a situation that they had to deal with immediately with no help yeah right and that's what you you really think about and wonder when we we there's a big difference between having support and having resources and knowing how to utilize them and not being able to function without them. Mm-hmm. you know like we talked about like i was with listening to that podcast on my drive up with Muleman talking about technology and the different light and everything like that well we talk about dependency on technology you know we're almost breeding a culture to be dependent on everything outside of yourself as an individual like can you just deal with something regardless of what it is regardless of how much time you have to deal with like you got to be able to just roll with the punches and perform in any aspect you know like um there isn't going to be accommodations for you in the real world when you have to as a therapist convince this patient to get out of their bed and come down to the gym and work out so that they can go home to their husband or wife and not live the rest of their days in a nursing home like you just have to be able to deal with it and and there's no Yes or no, it's if you can't do this, I'm going to fire you and find somebody else who can. Um, so it's, I don't know, this, I have never felt this way before as far as like the younger generation coming up until this year mm-hmm. um, and us just getting midterms in this week. Yeah. That was a nice eye opener uh, as Cause well. Because you, you have to have a GPA at Walsh. This oh, is this time. is this is an academic yeah. school. I mean our our year that we had a national champ in the hammer throw in the fifteen hundred, we also had the number one men's GPA in division two yeah. and our women were tenth. Um and I think last year last year, year before, it's all blur, our men were sixth and our women were sixth. I mean, and these are rough majors. I mean we on our out of my graduating class last year, it was a, a CPA. Um, I had a, a guy graduate, bypassed his fifth year of eligibility and master's because he already had a job um, to go be a CPA. He's taken those tests this summer. God yeah. bless him. Um, I have another guy who was government foreign affairs. He's down in Fort Worth right now. He was going the military route from it. And then of my girls, one in PT school at Walsh. One in PT school at Youngstown State. Um, one out in Colorado looking into getting a neuropsychology program. Um, one going engineering. Like these are not, you know, yeah. cookie cutter majors here. Um, and, and we did well academically as a university. But this year, uh, not, not as impressed. I let my, my newbies know that this is not the, the standard we, we hold right. to. And it's a lot of. You know, just go instead of I need to put more time in studying. It's a lot of where's the the accommodation center and all that. And do, kids do need that. I mean, I you yeah, know, I recognize the fact you need your your individualized education plans. I mean, it's like training. You know, right? You're gonna have to different training protocol for different people mm-hmm. based on what their functional weaknesses are and functional strengths. But at the end of the day. You have a job you need to get done. Yeah, and there's going to be a clock ticking to get it done. So, and I think just, that uh, uh, interesting. coming out of high school, a lot of these kids have been taken care of for so long, and then you throw them into an environment where they're independent for the first time ever. Yeah, and they can't figure out how to do anything. Yeah, you know how? When do I study? When yeah. do I make time to get my throwing in? When do I make time to? 
you know, relax and, and find things outside of school. But, you know, they have all, all this, um, all this freedom all of a sudden and all these options and they don't have the discipline yeah. to stay on the path when they're there. Well, because no one's ever the, given it to them. It's the independence, but you're also taking away a lot of the structure. Yeah, yeah. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, a lot of kids probably went to school in high school from eight to three. Then they went to practice, came home, had dinner, and parents yelled at them to study. Hopefully, yep. yep. You know, now let's just say you, you know, you have class. 8 to 9, 10 to 11, 11 to 12, practice group from 1 to 3, lifting 5 to 6.30. But Tuesday, Thursdays, you don't even have class. Yeah, right. You know, what do you do in those situations? And, I mean, for the majority, you know, our student athletes at Walsh do really well. But, I mean, I'd be lying if I said not, you know, everybody made it. You know, we had a kid that had like a 3.6 first semester, and Fortnite came out, and he failed out. You know, like that yeah. stuff does happen if you don't have the the discipline and the time yep. management skills and and all those things. You you got to be able to just get your crap done. Yeah, and no one's gonna help you now. Yeah. And and it's it it's tough to make a kid. I always have said that it's ridiculous, in my opinion, to make an eighteen year old kid decide what they want to do for the rest of their lives. But that's the system we live in. Yeah. So you have to you have to start raising these kids with some discipline and and some independence and you don't always have to do their laundry for them and you don't have to cook for them well, you know you know a 13 14 year old kid should be able to do all that stuff you yeah. know and and you shouldn't have to harp on them to like so I never wake my son up in the morning He's got an alarm. He's got his phone. He wakes himself up. He gets to, gets to school. You know, simple things like that. I have parents in here who talk about how they have to rush home from the gym and slap their kids around to get them out of bed and in, to school. And I'm like, what are you? What are they going to do next year? Yeah. You know, I mean, I knew when I went to uh, to college for the first time that uh, I'm a morning person, and come seven o'clock at night, I'm starting to drag. So I didn't take any evening classes right. because I knew. That wasn't going to be good for me, you know. I just wasn't going to be able to function uh, in those eight a.m. classes. Nobody's in them, so it was nice. Right. But, um, yeah. It. I. Uh, I lament uh, the way our our youth are right now, and I, I. I'm hoping to see a pendulum swing in the other direction. You know, I. I always talk about the generations, and you know, you had the World War II generation. Who went off and saved the world, and they gave birth to the baby boomers, who, you know, were the hippies, and and you know nowadays are ruining everything. Um, and then they gave birth to Generation X, and we came along, and you know, I think we did some good things, and and uh, you know we we uh, we were a little bit tougher and a little bit more disciplined, and then we gave birth to these millennials, who are again swinging back down, you know. Yeah. And I'm just hoping that pendulum swings back up again, and um, I think it will. But uh, it, it it disturbs me the the amount of lawyers involved in every occupation and every yeah. endeavor, and it's it's so hamstringing, guys. Well, so uh, not even the coaching, just the PT work. I go to um, a girl who. Uh, does body work on me and everything. And she was explaining to me, I said, well, you know, why did my PT ever do this for me? And she goes, he can't. He's not allowed to do that by law. He goes, yeah. She goes, I don't have any restrictions on me, but if he does that and someone sues him, he's in a lot of trouble, you know? Yeah. So, you know, here I can go to this girl who can do all these different treatments on me that the guy who has more education isn't allowed to do. Yeah. So it's they, really they, hamstringing those people. Big time. And I mean, again, listen to that podcast on the drive up. You were talking about chiropractic versus PT and everything. And, you know, where that uh, stigma, I guess you'd call it, against chiropractic stems from. And, you know, I, if I could go back, I probably would have gone chiropractic. So yeah. I thought that. But, uh, you know, there are no chiropractic schools in Ohio. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Palmer is the one in Iowa, and then there's one down in Georgia, I know. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's what Mule Mule is, the one in Georgia. Right. But it's, 
I don't know. I, from from where I sit at, as a PTA and being involved in that, you know, I, I think, um, and again, it depends on the demographic. Like I'm, I'm working with your, you know, your elderly yeah, and everything yeah. like that. But it's a lot also of, I don't know if it's just because it was always viewed as Western medicine or whatever for so long. It wasn't as verifiable. I don't know. But yeah. I, I'm wholeheartedly into chiropractics. I definitely um, think some people just uh, need need realigned. Um, people, you know, you know, you hear Rogan talk about it. Rogan is vehemently anti chiropractor. Yeah. And it's like, I've had problems, and I know it's not psychosomatic I, I i know that the chiropractor has helped me and yeah. made me feel better and got me back out to training um and and the thing about it is is i have a pt too mm-hmm. and if i'm at the pt and i start complaining that my neck hurts or whatever he adjusts my neck the exact same way that the chiropractor does really? so those techniques are yeah they're, I mean, in, they're in there the, uh, the therapy world they're called just mobilizations and there's yeah. different grades to them like there's a grade one through i think it's five and as an assistant i think i'm only allowed to do a grade one or two right um i'm allowed to do a grade one or yeah. two you know i like i'll have a i have a patient right now who's a a good one who you know he's in a tilt and space wheelchair can't propel himself anywhere Neck stuck like this all yeah. the way down, chin to chest all the time. Um, and he's in our treatment, and I, you know, he's a max assist transfer from his chair to a mat table. I got to use a spin disc because he can't turn his feet. Wow. So I basically pick this guy up, put him on a mat, have to take him from sitting on the side of the mat to laying down. I have to position all these pillows for him to just be in even a remotely comfortable position yeah. it's not comfortable for him because he's so contorted basically and i sit there and i pull on his neck for 15 minutes and i work all cervical traction mm-hmm. um and then i'll open his chest up and do some other aspects just for positioning yeah i mean would i love to be able to do uh chiropractics and give him some more aggressive treatment than what i can do as a therapist assistant just doing basically manual traction and massage and and uh stretching definitely like yeah. he's a perfect example that i wish i could snap him around a little bit yeah and try yeah. and realign some things but again the whole legality of it yeah. not allowed um because you have the license because you I know have she license. can go do yeah. stuff like that because she doesn't have license yeah. and if she goes to a, a weekend seminar and learns a new technique and comes back and it doesn't work. No one's going to sue her. Yeah. But you have a license, so now you there's a target exactly. on you. And it's not only that. Me being an assistant too, I can't do anything outside of my scope of practice that wasn't established by my overseeing PT. Yeah. Right. Now my overseeing PT and the rehab manager, um, both. If I ask them if I can do something, they say yes, as mm-hmm. long as it's within my scope of practice. Right. Like they give me free range. Yeah. They trust uh, you. You've been awesome. around. Yeah. So, but again, I can't, I have to document everything I do. Um, and I can't do a grade four mobilization if legally I'm not allowed, you know, I can't. Sure. Right. So I have to document whatever. So, and that's where, you know, maybe that's something to do with the whole difference between PT and chiropractics is just a level of documentation you have to do. Mm-hmm. Like I know Corey said in that um, podcast how, what was he talking about, how a, a chiropractor that'll do mobilizations for asthma or something, and maybe they just document it better, and that's where it's replicatable for another chiropractor. You know, I, I have to word for word write down everything I do, level of assist, assistive device yeah, to use, right. you know, um, if I'm giving any verbal cueing, any tactile cueing, like Jesus. it's it's just a nightmare of paperwork. Yeah, and maybe that's a big part of the the different worlds there. Um, and I don't know. You yeah, know, I've been to chiropractors. I've been adjusted, but then I didn't go see them go write all their notes up. So I don't know. I don't know what the the statement is. I'm all for chiropractics, but I also think um, some people steer away from it. I know. When I was in high school, I went to a chiropractor a lot for my spine. Um, 
and it was just, you know, I feel great. Two weeks later, I don't. I go back. But I think it's also people get sick of the cycle, mm-hmm. and that's where I went the PT route because it's more of, like, my stance is on you can fix just about anything by getting stronger specifically sure. to your needs. Yeah. You know, but I also believe sometimes you just need snapped out of whack, and then we got to strengthen you mm-hmm. up and build you up. You know, it doesn't matter how strong I get you, if, you know, your collarbone's in the wrong spot. I'm going to be strengthening you to a non-stable position, we're still going to have issues. Right, right. So I think it's something, and you do hear about some places that work more hand-in-hand therapy with chiropractics, but those are few and far I think that I think it's the the best way to go. I love the... the um the more inclusive approach to medicine. I, I love talking. I've talked to a couple people. I've had uh, two or three people on the show who are involved in, in what's basically a new field is, is this functional medicine yeah. where, you know, you go to the Cleveland clinic for, and see the functional medicine specialist where I think the program started and, you know, they have PTs and they have nutritionists and they have, oh, yeah. you know, just everyone you could possibly imagine to make it a more um, all-encompassing approach to your fitness. Right. And, like, I, I understand where where some problems with some chiro. There's going to be bad chiros and good chiros just like everybody else mm-hmm. in every other field. Um, and, like... I go, I used to go, before I started getting the shot, I used to go to my Cairo for acupuncture for my allergies. Yeah. Well, I've had dry needling done 100 times. For some reason, dry needling doesn't work on me. Everybody loves it. Everybody's like, oh, you're going to get dry needled. I've been dry needled 100 times, and it yeah. never works. I don't know why. But for some reason, the acupuncture worked on my allergies. Yeah. So I'm guessing it's not psychosomatic because I was fully going in there expecting this to fail. Right. Just because it's failed every time. My wife said, well, why don't you just go try it one more time? And I know they're different, but I went in there expecting it not to work, and right. it ended up working. So I can't um, – yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's like we talked about. It. Everybody responds to different things. Yeah. I mean, like if you wrote – yourself a training program or you wrote one for me it may take 10 pounds off you may put 10 yeah. pounds on me it's just how the body's going to respond different like dog differently um like you know therapy uses a lot of modalities you know your your heat your ice your electrical stimulation your ultrasound dry needling like you know diathermy there's a, a million different things I don't buy into 95% of them. Yeah. Um, I know some places, like the girl that was shadowing me this past weekend had done some um, observation in like your outpatient orthopedic clinic where they put a hot pack on them to start, then they'll do some exercises and some stretching, all manual therapy, all hands-on stuff. Mm -hmm. Then they'll e-stim them afterwards, and then they'll ice them down and send them on their way. I think, yes, some people are going to benefit from some of that. You know, about the only time I will use our e-stim unit at therapy is for pain management for somebody who's frankly not willing to do the stuff I want them to do. Yeah. And I can't make them. Yeah. um, Which usually those people don't get better anyway. Um, But, uh, again, I was one that I had. God, I don't even know how many injuries through college and high school. I've had the E-STEM. I've had ultrasound. I've had dry needling when I tore my bicep. Like, I'm just not into it either. Right. You know, like, do I understand the science behind them? But, yeah. But, uh, again, it's just, you got to find what works. You yeah. Know what works better for me than dry needling my back? Reverse hyper for three weeks, twice a week. You know? <laughs> And that's me. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's yeah. just how I respond best to things. I respond better when I'm not being a bum. Uh, yeah. I feel my best. So some people, again, you got to cook them a little bit. I, I don't know. But it's just. Uh, I'm sure you're getting people in there, too, who are. Um, well, you get you get a much older demographic. But I'm sure a lot of PTs are getting people in who are starting a fitness program. They're not used to the fitness program. Yeah. They have DOMS and they're 
they they can't tell the difference between soreness and an injury. And oh yeah, I, you know, I had a girl one time when I was a high school coach and I was doing the weight program and the throws, and she, uh, you know, I don't know if she came out of the band or she was she was one of these uh, very artsy girls. So I'm not sure what where she came, but she decided for some reason I think she was a heavy girl. Someone told her that she should try the shot put, of course. Yeah. So she comes out the first day, and I put her through like the world's most basic, easy. I don't want to hurt this girl yeah. workout. She ended up going to the emergency room the next day because she was so sore. Yeah. And her mother got a hold of me, and I said, "Ma'am, I said it, it, she was sore, you know." And, yeah. and and that she said, "Well, that's what the doctor said." And she's you know not allowed to, not allowed to lift for two weeks. And I was just like, "Oh Christ!" Yeah. And you know she wasn't any good anyhow, and never never stuck with it, but. I think uh, that's not uh, necessarily just new kids. I mean, 40-year-old adults will get the same thing. Same thing. I can't work out because I'm sore, you know. Well, and again, Judd Judd being referenced again, as always on this. Always on the show, uh, yeah. He tells the story of how he had a girl, and I think this was before my time, um, who first day of conditioning, the, the next day, he gets a, a call from her saying she tore both of her quads. <laughs> so amazing. And, and thought yeah. that these were injuries. Right. You know, big difference between hurt and injured. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, I make that disclaimer before our first day of conditioning. You're going to feel hurt a lot. Yeah. You know, that's, you got to, um, you know, basically tear muscle to build muscle. You know, I had my first anatomy teacher in high school made that analogy is, your body's like a boat, and we are intentionally drilling holes in the boat and taking on water because when you patch that hole, that is now the strongest part of the boat. Yeah, yeah. Those patches, you know. So, yeah, you're going to take on some water. That's that's your yeah. soreness. And there are things you can do to decrease the amount of soreness you're going to feel with recovery and, you know, rolling out and having proper nutrition and getting enough sleep and making sure you're hydrated before and after, but you're still going to feel it. I think that's the, one of the biggest things that people miss is the hydration. And, oh yeah. And, um, it, it was big for me. Uh, I'm drinking coffee all day long. And for a while there, it was like, I'm drinking coffee all day long and I get home from work and I have rum and then I go to sleep. And I realized that God, I need to fix this, you know, and once I started hydrating better, oh, my, amazingly, my flexibility got better, and I wasn't so beat up. Now, I tell people all the time, I'm 46 years old. I've been training since I was 12. I am constantly in pain. I mean, constantly in pain, but it's nothing. There's no injury. It, yeah. It's just pain. Right now, both my elbows and all my fingers hurt. Because I did five jujitsu classes in the, in the well, I did four in the last forty eight hours, and then one on Sunday, and it's just from gripping geese and yeah. pulling on people, and everything hurts. And you know, I won't do any upper body work today. You know, I'll probably go run a few miles because my legs feel okay. But you can't just give into that. Do nothing. You can't just do nothing. Yeah, because yeah, you're going to hurt way worse when you're sixty. Yeah, yeah, and with with the hydration thing, I mean. So our our first day of conditioning um, was, uh, let's see, I think I had, of my 20 athletes, I think we lost four or five of them, didn't make it through the whole thing. <laughs> um, and then afterwards, I had my fifth year senior guys, I asked them, you know, on a scale of one to 10, how would you rate this workout based on difficulty yeah. compared to the last four years you've been through this? They rated it a four out yeah. of 10. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, included, um, there was one trip to the ER. <laughs> uh, more of a al- weird allergic reaction oh, situation. Okay. Um, I thought maybe it was sore, just too hard. But there was also a, to bypass the remainder of the story, they also said dehydration, heat exhaustion. Mm-hmm. Um, turned out that wasn't really what it was. That was something involved in it. But... While they're saying this, I'm, I'm drilling them. How much water do you have today? Yeah. And they held up a, one of the 24-ounce water things. And they're like, oh, two of these. 
and they were halfway through it. Uh huh. Said so. Is that the second one or the third one? So you mean to tell me, under forty ounces of water is all you have had today? Yeah. Leading up to this first workout of the year on a Friday, it is September first. It is ninety degrees out, and you thought mm-hmm. forty ounces of water was going to be enough? Yeah. Come on. And it still carries over today. Like this was in September. Yesterday, one of my freshmen's out at practice, and I, you know, was asking them how how they were feeling after the lift Monday, Tuesday, because we're on the first week of an eccentric cycle, like wrecked, mm-hmm. um, and they're feeling like hot garbage. And I asked them, you know, how hydrated are you? And the response was, I've had a pop. <laughs> That's it. Only fluid they've even taken in. Yeah. And it's like Coke or something that's just jam packed the sugar. You're better sure. off probably drinking nothing. Yeah. You know. And just the, the awareness of the, the recovery aspect of it is just mind-boggling how bad it is at, at any level. It's just, you know, people think you, it's work harder, you know. And I, I agree with that mentality to an extent, but how hard can you work if you don't recover from the mm-hmm. last one? It's yeah. that diminishing. You can get 100% out of this workout, but then you're only going to be able to physically get 90% yeah. out if you are maxing out. And then it's 80 and so on and so on and so on. Yeah. And there's a, you know, there's the, the, the super compensation, but there's got to be a place where you compensate. Right. You have to stop and let yourself yeah. compensate, you know. If, if, you know, if that's your goal, well, even if it, your goal isn't explosive power, mm-hmm. for explosive power, you definitely less is more on a lot of occasions, yeah. you know. If you're just training to get in shape, well, you know, maybe you can train every day because yeah. maybe you're riding the bike one of those days right. or something like that. But um, people need to realize that that there there's a di- difference. And when I say people need to realize that, athletes need to realize that. Yeah. If if um, if you're going to to your local Planet Fitness or if you're coming into a gym like this, and most likely you need more. Yeah, you, you know, because I get that all the time. I get people who First thing they want to do, my wife does meal prepping for people, and I'm here at the gym all day. So they start the fitness program. You know, when's our deload? <laughs> you know, you for, need a deload. yeah, we'll we'll load you first. Yeah. You know, and then I'll let you know when to deload. And then my wife, it's the same thing. She'll have sit down consults with people before she does the meal prepping <laughs> with them. And the first thing they want to do is they want to know cheat meals. Yeah. When can I have cheat meals? And you know, oh, you're gonna put me on a low carb. Uh, diet. Well, I found this recipe for low carb cheesecake and low carb pizza, yeah. and it's like, fuck. Here's your steak. Yeah. Just eat that. Yes. You know. So everybody's always looking for this. Looking for the loophole. Loophole to to keep their their lifestyle exactly the way it is without any change, yeah. but get a change in results. Yeah, and that's yeah, and I mean it's 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 crazy. It's just such an all encompassing thing. I mean, recovery is something that interests me a lot. Um, and I was going to tell you, you got to check out this guy, Kirk um, Parsley. He is a Navy SEAL, um, got his doctorate in sleep studies. Okay. Um, I think I first heard him talk on, I think it was that Barbell Shrugged mm-hmm. podcast. And yeah. And just blew my mind. Um, you know, because I'm someone, I've had a significant amount of concussions. Um, but he talked about guys in the military, and he was doing sleep studies on them and how half of them were addicted to, like, sleep aids and everything and everything to knock themselves out. And he said he looked at the brain waves of a guy taking um, – what's the big one they use? Um, oh, gosh. I don't know. One, one of those sleep aids to just knock yourself out. Like Ambien? Ambien, yeah. yeah that was it. Um, he looked at all these military guys that were taking that to – to sleep because they needed it Mm -hmm. and he compared the brain waves and the brain waves of somebody on ambient to sleep versus somebody going through the cycles of sleep it was more comparable to somebody got cracked in the head with a baseball pat and was knocked unconscious than it was to somebody actually sleeping and these guys are all addicted to it because they think i'm unconscious this is sleep but zero recovery so he was looking at like testosterone levels of these 25 year old you know military guys that you would think are through the freaking roof you know just nothing but training and high you know yep, yep. um high stress situation and they are just 
garbage. Yeah. Like through the floor. And it was super interesting. And it, it, it was, I listened to it a couple of years ago, but I always reference that to try and get my athletes to pay attention. Yeah. Because right now we're in the time of year where, you know, we're in midterms. I just chewed you out for a couple of your grades. We're in our third week of formalized lifting program. We're doing five second eccentrics. Um, nervous systems are shot. We're where the weather's going from 70 degrees to 30 degrees at yeah. night. Everybody's a hot mess. Now we talk about, well, you had a pop today mm -hmm. and you slept four hours. What is that? You know, let's, let's look at this a little yeah. bit. So now you're going to get sick. And then now you're not going to recover from more. That's even more. It's like, come on. Like, yeah. You've got to look at the big picture here. You can't just show up, work hard, and then move on. Like you have to do the things in between right. to really get the benefit out of it. Um, you know, it's like the kids that stay up all night studying when they're better off probably studying for two hours and going to bed. Sleep is such a big deal. And, and I know how much sleep I need based on, and this is the least scientific thing in the world, but I, I base it on when I naturally wake up on the weekends. Yeah. So I go to bed at... 9.30, and I still wake up at like 5.30, yeah. you know? So I wake up during the week at 4.30 a.m. every day, and I feel great. I pop out of bed, and no yeah. big deal. Um, but I think it ends up being like, you know, six and a half, seven hours most yeah. nights. And um, I just feel great on that, and I don't I, – I wake up after that. I'm awake. You know, I don't need an alarm. Um Talking about the testosterone levels, I had a friend who was in the military and dealt with a lot of explosives, got out um, in his mid to late 20s and was having all those problems, having problems sleeping, low sex drive, yeah. worst shape of his life. I'm like, what the fuck? You know, this guy was a hard charger. I'm like, you know, what's the problem? And, and he came to me for advice and I said, go get your your testosterone levels checked. It's yeah. 100%. I guarantee that's what these explosive charges have fried your brain because it's, it's, a, it's a head trauma every yeah. time you do it, you know. And he went and got checked, and he was low yeah. at 27 years old right. or something, you know. I mean, yeah. craziness. Yeah. That it's, should never be a problem. Yeah, but it's just, it's again, like each, each uh, cycle of sleep, is responsible for something different like your your light sleep is responsible for like physical musculature recovery or whatever and don't quote me on these I'm sure yeah mixing I them all up. i'm just yeah. making examples mm -hmm. and like your rem sleep is gonna that's when you're going to store your memories and everything like that and you know deep sleep is going to be um digestion and things mm -hmm. like that like each one's responsible for a different aspect of recovery or that homeostasis yes you know right. of yeah. i'm running through walls all day long well i've got to balance that out with my sleep mm -hmm. and if you're talking about taking a drug or something that you don't get rem sleep because you're knocked out yeah and maybe you're only getting deep sleep but you're not getting the you know, light sleep and then the rapid eye movement sleep. So you're not storing anything mentally. Physically, you're not recovering. Yeah. You're just knocked out. And you wake up and you still feel, you, you, know, you feel like a zombie. Right. You don't feel like you slept. Yeah, my you know? wife is super susceptible to anything. So anything you give her, like two margaritas and this chick is passed out. I mean, she's <laughs> hammered. Um, it, you know, she'll, she'll take a muscle relaxer. We had muscle relaxers. I can't remember if... She must have gotten prescribed for something, but I would have to take three of them to feel anything. She yeah. takes a half, and she is fucked up. Yeah. And, you know, with, with the sleeping pills, you know, she takes NyQuil, and she wakes up the next morning and has to call in sick to work because she's so fucked up. from. Right. So we're all different. And But but those sleep aids are, you got to get away from those things. Oh, they, you you got to figure out your own sleep. You're going to, I mean, I don't understand insomnia. I don't... Uh, I thank God I've never had that problem, and I don't understand the, the the scientific, you know, problems behind it. But if I find it hard to believe that 
if you came with me for a day and worked out with me for a day and did all the shit I do in a day, you're not going to sleep good at night. Yeah. It's just put yourself know. in a state where you're exhausted, you yeah. know? And I mean, I, you know, and I'm I'm totally a hypocrite now with my athletes, and I yell at them all the time about doing all these recovery things and everything. And then I look back at my own athletic career at Ashland, and I look at all the injuries and setbacks I had, and then I also look at the fact that I probably averaged three to five hours a night yep. all through college. But that's your job. You're yeah. the coach now. Yeah. And you try to, right. if you can get one person to listen exactly. to you. Like, I have a girl who is uh, going to have... A phenomenal career, uh, but right now really struggling and was not sleeping enough because overwhelmed by the academic side of things. And I'm was telling me how they were trying to take Nyquil to sleep and everything. I'm like, oh, like. And in the podcast, that guy says, you know, uh, microdosing melatonin. You know, that's something I take. I don't, I don't do, you know, your Nyquils, anything like that. I'll take a little bit of melatonin and not, not every night. Yeah. um, You know, on and off because basically you're. Your body pretty much produces everything mm-hmm. to one extent or another. Um, so when you supplement something, you know, there has to be a need to produce these things. Sure. So if you, you know, aren't pretty, I mean, that's your whole diabetes dilemma right now. Mm-hmm. You know, people just started pumping things up and then they're, you know, they're hooked on it and everything like that. And they'll never get off of insulin yeah. and everything like that. You know, it's the same thing with with everything. You look at your melatonin. Your body produces it already to help you sleep and everything and get into different phases. But if you're sitting there and you take 10 milligrams every single night and then you forget them one night, yeah. you will not sleep that night. I take, uh, you ever fuck around with CBD oil at all? No, but it's something I've been very interested in just as it's gained traction. I mean, obviously I have to have my... NCAA stance on things, but sure, yeah, personally, right. like it's something I I can definitely. Um, I mean, I appreciate all science and all forms of recovery and thing like that, and that's something that I definitely it interests me a lot. It's um, it's, I, and I've tried different. I, I'm we're sponsored by Warrior CBD, um, and they're they're from out west, and there's a huge difference between the CBD oils you see here in Ohio yeah. and out West well, Christ, the stuff here is just essential oils, right? Like anyway. Total garbage. So I've tried a lot of different from here, from other places. This, this stuff works really well. Um, but what's nice about it is last night, my wife had a volleyball game. I don't sleep well when she's not there she wasn't going to get home until like 11 o'clock at night. And I didn't want to be up till 11 o'clock at night. I did a little bit of CBD oil. I relaxed. Boom. I was yeah. out. But tonight, I'll fall asleep fine. Yeah. You know, there's no, there's no addictive quality to it where right. I have to have it to fall asleep. And I'll go, you know, a couple of days and forget to take it. And then something's coming up and I know I really want to get good sleep tonight or I know I'm going to have a problem sleeping tonight. And I'll take a little bit of it and just, right. there's nothing harsh about it. It's not like you get high or anything. Yeah. You just relax and everything's cool. Yeah. Um, I mean, with, with that, like, I think people almost... Like, there is addiction, but a lot of things, it's so much just habitual with people. Yeah, yes, yes. You can be addicted to going to McDonald's as an old guy and sitting around with your buddies, and the day that doesn't happen, it will throw off your entire day and mess you up. 100%. You know? Um, And I think that's where people confuse addiction with habit forming, Um, you know? Like, again, how many people drink coffee every single day? Me, yeah. Right? That doesn't mean you are a, addicted to coffee and caffeine. Mm-hmm. It's, it's your, your, you know, your, um, your cycle. Your, it's, it's just what you do. I have times you of know? the day that I drink coffee, and I, right. it's, it's, I drink it's at the same habitual. time every day. It's routine. Day. Mm-hmm. That doesn't mean it's an addiction. It means it's a routine. Yep. You know? Now, if you're somebody that is, is going to go... Um, shoot up your family to take their money to go buy heroin or something that's an addiction right you right. know but people give like i mean i'm a total caffeine guy i mean i'm a junkie as far as that goes and you know i i i like it and it makes me feel better yeah. and uh, i'm a happier guy when i'm more alert and higher functioning it doesn't mean i'm addicted to caffeine it just means it's it's habitual for me and 
uh, again, we're talking about increasing your capacity to function. You know, it's like anything. Uh, caffeine does for me what some people a cold shower does for them. Yeah. Or what some people uh, going on a long run first in the morning thing in the morning does for them. The habit thing is, I believe, 100% right. You know, um, I remember Mike Trevisano, who's a local uh, Cleveland um, radio host, made the comment about he was laughing because they were playing commercials on the radio station for uh, people who are addicted to gambling. And he goes, you know who isn't addicted to gambling? Winners. The winners don't bitch that they're addicted. It's the guys that are losing all the time that are addicted to gambling. I had a friend, um, a few, few, this is a few years back, and uh, um, he was a great guy to me. He was, he was, he was a good dude. Uh, he uh, got caught up in some kind of weird sex scandal. And I decided I, I didn't want any part of that. You know, okay, this wasn't the guy I know. Yeah. This was something that was being hidden from me. And uh, he called me up and he said, hey, uh, maybe we should go get coffee or something. And I'm like, nah. I said, I'm good, man. You know, and uh, we talked a little bit and he said, well, you know, what if I told you this was a sex addiction? And I said, I don't give a fuck what you call it. Yeah. You know, I said, I'm addicted to sex too. I chase my wife around the house constantly. But, it, 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 you know, I, it doesn't control my life. Right. You know, you're not addicted to this shit. You just have bad habits, you know, and a lack of discipline. And um, so I cut off that relationship because I didn't want to be involved in it. And you, you can't blame addiction for everything that goes wrong with your brain. Right. You know, you, you you, you've got choices you to make. You blame addiction for um, working and making a lot of money. Yeah, right. You know? Yeah. Are you, you know, and I mean, some people it almost... I mean, again, it's, is it a habit? Is it a positive or is it a negative? Addiction is associated with negative. Mm-hmm. You know, you know, you, is it a habit or is it an addiction that you need to work out? Right? I don't Would feel good. Would people call it a negative addiction if, if, if it was something positive or not? Like yeah. you just said with, with gambling addiction, winners, You're winner. aren't, winners aren't addicted. Yeah. Winners, that's, that's a career. Yeah. That's what it is. That's, they, they changed the title of it. I mean, yeah, addiction is is uh, associated with a negative thing, but I think it's again, I think that's just a, a term that has went from something it was appropriate for when you talk about like a a drug addiction or something like that, to where you see those extreme cases where again you will do bad things ethically to get that right versus. Is it just part of your routine? Yeah. If you don't have coffee this morning, you aren't going to go, you know, rob a Dunkin' Donuts for yeah. one cup of coffee. Yeah, right. You know, like that, to me, that's that's the difference between a, an addiction and a habit, maybe a negative habit. Sure. But, like, is this something that you will compromise your morals and ethics over? You know? But Yeah, I, I you know, I can't... Uh... I can't relax at night. So, you know, one of my favorite things in the world is to get off here at the gym, put in a full day, go home, have a, a Cuba Libre and a nice dinner and relax. Yeah. But I can't do that if I didn't put the work in earlier today. So if I wasn't busting my ass and doing jujitsu and working out or running or whatever, I I won't be able to do that. You know, and that's some weird quirk in my brain, but it's it's again a positive thing not a negative yeah. one you know so we all have weird quirks that right. we we need to deal with but um <laughs> to me it's not an addiction it's just a, a positive habit right. that you have yeah. you know yeah. i mean that's that's me and coaching i tell people my my job is i'm a pca my dirty habits coaching sure yeah. you know could could i i give up coaching and make twice as much money being a full-time PTA? Definitely. Yeah. You know, would I have uh, two to three days off a week instead of none? Yep. But, again, coaching gives me something that I do not get from being sure. a PTA. Yeah. And that type of thing. So that, to me, it's, it's a habit. Now, again, I'm not going to, you know, do something crazy like, divorce my wife to just be a coach so I don't have to f- support anyone but me mm-hmm. or something crazy like that. No. 
I would give up coaching before I did that. Because sure. It wouldn't compromise my ethics. That, to me, it's, it's a habit. It's not an addiction. Mm -hmm. It would be very difficult for me. But, again, that, that would be that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's it's a good way of looking at it, that you're not uh, the difference being that you're not compromising your principles and ethics to to engage in whatever you're engaging in. You know, you have people who are um functioning alcoholics, you know, and and it doesn't ruin their lives. It doesn't it, they're ruining their health, but they're not hurting anybody else yeah. doing it that way. And um I've had people in my life who were hysterical drunks and so loving and and fun to be around you know it's and uh i get it again you're they're hurting themselves but it's not like anyone's getting hurt or yeah. beaten or they're not driving drunk and yeah. they're just fun well, drunks you like, know and that's a crazy thing too and this is you know it's along the lines of what we're talking about but it's so i had a guy and i may have told you this the last time we were on it i had a guy at the the nursing home who had a doctor's script Right? And he was on a, a peg tube, so can't can't eat or drink by mouth. Everything would go through a tube right into his system. Had a doctor's script for two Miller lights via peg tube. It's the craziest thing. What I've the ever fuck did seen. he eat? Like got your tower with your IV and everything else. Yeah. Nurse comes in, ksh, dumps him in. Yeah. Wow. He didn't last long. No. Obviously. But, you know. To see a doctor's script for that is the most unbelievable thing I think I've ever seen in all of my years working. Yeah, that is that is addiction. That that might be an addiction. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> you, you you don't want to get to that point in your life for sure. Cannot cannot function without this aspect. Well, you have people all the time who you know again going back to like the 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 new people who start and want to get in shape or want to start a nutritional plan and. The first thing they'll do is tell me that they can't give up beer or they can't give up pop. And I'm like, go fuck yourself. Yeah. You know, I <laughs> you want my help or not? Yes, yeah. you you can't drink, you can't work out all week and then drink twelve beers on the weekends. Yeah, you just fucked yourself. Yeah, cancel it out. <clears throat> yeah, I it, it I, the the it, it, there has to be you if you come into a program and you're in. And you want to get better, there's going to be sacrifice, and you have to learn that that's a good thing. Yeah. You know, you're sac you're not sacrificing time with your family, you're not sacrificing, you know, your job, you're sacrificing all the shit that is holding you back. You know, and yeah. just for a little bit of oh, that tastes good. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. instant gratification. That's yeah, what gets everybody. You know, that you can put those brownies away and 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 make the right choices and yeah it's frustrating but um at least at your level you get with with the athletes coming in you get them young enough that you can make these positive changes in their lives and help oh, yeah. them do that you know it's got to be a lot easier for a 19 year old than it is for a you know a 45 year old yeah it's there's there's a lot of people i get at the nursing home that i you know you, you know you can tell immediately the people you're going to be able to do a lifestyle change with and the people that aren't. Yeah. And the people that aren't are the ones that have the longest stays at the nursing Yeah, home, yeah. You know. Um, so it is it is what it is. That's my, my balance. I get that. And it's, it's cool to see the, the, um, the older demographic, too, that are, are open to things and do those things. And you see them just take off and it totally changes their life yeah um, but it also is beating your head against the wall for the ones that are just and the other no thing is what. is that that baby boomer generation and older have been fed a line of bullshit health-wise yeah. for their entire lives yeah. so you know you try to like my parents freak out that i've been on this ketogenic diet for so long and now i'm full carnivore but they're they're you know they're they're Sure, I'm going to die. And, you know, I go out to eat with them and I put salt on my food. And they're like, oh my God, you're going to die. My yeah. blood pressure is low. Right. I've got low b blood pressure. I'm great. You know, all my blood works great, but they don't understand it. And the doctors you go to are the same way. So you yeah. get a doctor who's been out of medical school for 10 years, right. they're way behind the curve, yeah. you know? And you know, and that's, a, you know, the U.S. as a whole is a big problem medically. You know, we'll get people in the, nursing home that have never taken a pill in their life and then you know they 
it's it's not just one or two pills when you get in there. It's you know the average person probably takes five to seven pills every morning. Like, yeah, I'll go to get them for therapy. The nurse will stop me before I take them down and they hand them their cocktail. Yeah, it's it's insane how much they just oh this one's for this, this one's for that. Well, how about we just get you in a better physical condition yeah. where again your body produces things. Yeah, you know. Now again, some people need things, but I think it's a lot of just blowing things out of proportion i mean we have a uh, one of those stupid little wrist blood pressure cuffs down there mm-hmm. and mine was pretty high there mainly because it was not functioning properly and i tried to tell everyone that but my god they had an intervention for me at work <laughs> uh to the point where i actually and i do not go to doctors normally um to where i went and got a physical this was fine yeah, and it's like, come on, like you got to just roll with everything. Like if it was something where I was having symptoms or anything, or if I was on a legitimate test, you know, whatever. Okay, maybe I should do something about it. But in reality, like, and if, even with like the pain scale, and that's where you talked about the CBD oil and everything and like that, and that's why it interests me so much is like for more pain management and opioid addiction and everything like that is I. Most people, well, not, I can't say most, but a lot of people just have no perception. Like anytime you are in any kind of a medical establishment, they basically have to ask you what's your pain, zero to ten, because it's all about you know, no one should have to live in pain. Sure, like the motto yep. of the healthcare field. Um, and I mean, I and the way I do, describe it to people to try and get a more honest answer is zero is you feel like you can do anything right now. 10 is, you would rather have me try and chop your leg off with my bare hand than wait five minutes to get an ambulance to take you to the hospital. Yeah, right. And then, oh, I'm 11. Yeah. Come on. Like, it, the awareness of it's ridiculous. Like, I, I probably have a broken toe right now because I got mad during conditioning and kicked my speaker across the room <laughs> because we couldn't follow just, just my directions. Right. Um, and that was four or five weeks ago. And it, you know, wakes me up at night, burning sensation in my foot. You know, my wife and I drove down to Columbus uh, Saturday. And the, the two-hour drive, every once in a while, I just kind of jump and flinch. Uh-huh. Just shooting pain for no reason. And I'm, she's yelling at me to go see a doctor. And I'm like, eh, you know, I'm fine. Um, but I'm thinking to myself, okay, so right now, if I'm pretty confident I have a broken toe, it's basically feels like I'm getting tased driving with my foot on the pedal on cruise control. What pain number am I in if I am still too stubborn to go to the doctor? Uh Uh-huh, yeah. So it's like, okay, well, it's obviously not a 10. Yeah. It's probably not a 9. We're probably more in the realistically like a 7 to 8 range. Yeah. You know? So, but do do people stop to think about that? Yeah, they're just 10. Yeah. You know? And people also, again, with the whole opioids and everything like that my first clinical rotation people know the system like we had when i first started my first clinical rotation was in whitehall down in columbus you're familiar mm-hmm. yeah not, not a great area mm-hmm. um and the patients knew well some of the patients knew if i say my pain is a zero to three i don't get a pain pill. three to six i get one seven to ten i get two 10, they'll call my doctor, or 10, they'll take me to the hospital. Nine, they'll call my doctor. Seven, I get two, and I don't have to answer any more questions. Perfect. Yep. Sweet spot. Exactly. Yeah. It's um, an interesting world. <laughs> yeah, especially when they're pushing the pain pills on you, right? Exactly. You know, and, yeah. the, and the companies want you on those pain pills. I'm, I'm a firm believer that the reason why cannabis is still illegal in a lot of places is you know, the business uh, sector not wanting it to be legal. You know, it's going to be a problem for drug companies. Yeah. Um, hemp can be turned into so many things. It's going to be a problem for textile companies. It's going to be a problem for the auto industry. Yeah, I um, agree. I was a big Dan Crenshaw uh, hopeful. Uh, do, do you know him, the, the politician? Yeah. Mm-hmm. He's a senator, and uh, I was a big. I, I I don't believe anyone should be able to be president unless they've been in the military. You shouldn't be called commander in chief unless you're in the military. And that comes from a guy who's never been in the military. But I was hopeful for Dan Crenshaw, former SEAL, senator, had some 
some good fiscal ideas. And he went on the Rogan show and still wanted uh, cannabis to be illegal. And I, yeah. And I'm not a big. I, I, it's in in my day to day life, cannabis being legal is not a big deal for me either way, one way or another. But when I hear that, I automatically think, oh, here's a guy who's in somebody's pocket because there's no real intellectual uh, argument to keep it illegal, you know. And for this guy to just say, oh no, no, we should definitely. You know, keep it illegal is yeah. somebody's somebody's got money somewhere coming in. Oh, big time! I mean, and, and again, that's it's something I've never even you know dabbled in, never been around really at yeah. all. But from what you see and you read about it and you hear about it, like I definitely think there's something to it. Yeah, yeah. you know. But then on the flip side, I look at the medical and healthcare industry, and yeah, I mean. Like it, it's just, it, it's crazy the stuff you see. Like I've got a guy, um, you know, I'll, I'll see patients with um, tremors and, and um, MS and CP and everything like that. And the one guy is an alcoholic because it stops his tremors. Now, we could pump him full of drugs and basically snow the guy. Or he's going to be a functional alcoholic. Well, not functional. He's going to be an alcoholic and put other people in danger. Yeah. He still drives. Um, but, again, then he can, you know, when, when you have something like that or, um, you know, he would reach for that cup and the closer you get in proximity, the more you shake mm-hmm. and then try and drink it. You know, that's a huge risk. Sure. Just imagine something like hot coffee. Yeah. You know, spill it all over something burns everywhere or know? shaving exactly. or something like so many factors yeah to where so you're saying you know alcohol stops those so that would make that situation safer but make other situations more dangerous when maybe a cbd or something mm-hmm. like that would help that guy and then you're not adding the risk of addiction to opioids or the risk of being you know incapacitated to be driving you know like what's what are we looking at what factors are we looking at on what's appropriate and what's not yeah you know what's our risk first reward addiction to drugs addiction to alcohol or addiction to something like that and i'm sure the alcohol companies don't want cannabis legalized either because it takes some money out of their pockets potentially and it's it's such a money grab and it it drives me nuts and like i said it's not an issue that uh you know most of the issues that argue about in in politics are of very little interest to me uh you know uh i'm pro-gay marriage but it doesn't come into my thoughts very often you know if you ask me it was up to me yeah sure let him get married i don't care You know, and and uh, the pro-choice versus pro-life. I'm pro-choice, but again, I'm a male at 46 years old, and it's not really going to affect me. You know, so hey, whatever. You know, do your thing. Um, and cannabis is the same way. But when I hear people vehemently opposed to legalizing it, I just see money. I just see dollar signs popping oh, up over right. people's heads. I think that's that's your biggest argument. I mean, against it. More than anything, yeah. is what what it would have on effect it would have on all these other industries, and you know, I think frankly, the industries that it would have a lot of effect on, frankly, aren't your your best industries. Sure, that's right. It's like, yeah, don't worry about this, and you know, the stigma it had attached to it way back when, based more on like the the THC aspect, of right? It. Um, all scare then, tactics, yeah, you know, it, really, like, it, but you know, but it seems pretty hypocritical to me how how anti other drugs are when you you look at the stats how as expensive is it for people to get oxy or something like that yeah. and that's where, where do you think they go sure they'll go to cheaper route because again that's an addiction yeah you know to opioids or painkillers or things like that that's that's an addiction yeah when you're in a room by yourself shitting yourself and having the shakes for a week because yeah, you took yourself do, off you're of gonna it. do anything yeah yeah and if your insurance is paying for those pills great we're good but what happens yeah. when they're not that's when people turn to those other avenues and things like that now yeah. there are people that again are justifiably 
addicted to things for sure. Like I see a lot of people in a lot of pain. Sure. Um, but again, like what's what's our end game here? Like it's that's you're you're leading them down a very deep dark path with that just for that quick fix one you're just frankly too closed minded because you're looking at something this has to be good because it's big industry yeah right First, you're talking about something that mm, i don't trust it because it's you know hippies growing weed or whatever right. what you're associating with right or you rather have it come from some giant pharmaceutical company right. who makes billions on billions on billions yep you know you trust that more you trust the you trust the money more than you know a lot of it but i agree i agree 100 percent. it's uh it's a problem that uh is going to get dealt with here hopefully soon and we can move on to the next issue that doesn't matter to anybody yeah, right. <laughs> you um so you got to get uh back for the uh practice today but uh when's when does indoor start we uh we kicked off conditioning about september 1st we started in in season training right around beginning of October. Yeah. Um what's the first time you're gonna be throwing down somewhere? First first comp will be December sixth. We'll go Youngstown State. Okay. For an indoor meet. Megan Tomei's place out yep. there. Yeah. Yep. And then uh the next day, the Saturday, we'll just go to Mountain Union mm -hmm. for a smaller scale meet. Um and that's it till after winter break. Um I know our sprints jumps distance will come back on. I think it's like the seventeenth of January. We'll be their first meet back after break. I'm holding off until the 25th. Yeah, I want another week under the belt, uh, back throwing with me and back uh, under the barbells a little bit before we jump into a comp. Yeah, right. But uh, yeah, it's they're they're chomping at the bit. I did things a little differently this year. Um, in our conditioning phase, you're allowed four hours a week of skill work, four hours a week of conditioning. Mm -hmm. So what I did was basically one hour of throwing four days a week and an hour of conditioning four days a week um so i basically broke it down by month the month of september my men did 12 pound my women did 3k mm -hmm. um, with hammer and shot put um, and then we tested at the end of it and then the month of october we're doing 14 pound for the men and then 3.5k for the women and we're testing it we'll test that on monday tuesday um, and then the end of November, we're going to test one more time um, with our comp level hammers and shot puts yeah. to see kind of where we're at. Interesting. Um, yeah. And it's something I haven't done before. I mean, I've gone back and forth with the different weighted implements, um, heavy and light, you know, but uh, definitely done more work with heavy than light. Mm -hmm. um, but I've been, I've been pretty happy with the, the results thus far. I mean, when we did our end of September test, um, had two guys over 58 mid in the hammer, another guy at 56, 57 mid in the hammer. Yeah. Um, you know, our girls did well in shot and hammer. All, all my hammer throwers except for one are new, um, on the women's side. So that was a big learning curve for them. Um, and it makes it a little easier transition for the freshmen. Yeah. Um. To, yeah, that's to for feel sure. The same way mm -hmm. to try and pick up technique on on shot put, clean up their rotational shot put, or if it's their first time rotating, uh, changing things along there before we're we're getting to the big uh, big uglies and yeah, heavy that's stuff, so. that's a daunting task to jump from that twelve pound ball to the sixteen pound ball for yeah, sure, big time. And that lovely thirty five pound weight they like to talk. Yeah, so that's a. A big eye opener for some of these younger guys about as far as their strength levels go yep. and having enough mass behind it and everything. So you get away with a lot of crap in high school, right? Right. So, and then you do you get to do their weightlifting program pretty much exclusively? Yeah, yeah that's good. Yeah, that's what's Our, nice about the Division two and Division three levels. You can yeah. get get that going. That's not something I'm gonna give up. Yeah, um, you know when I got to Walsh, they didn't have a real strength and conditioning coach. Um, so that's where I did all of it for the track team. Since then, we've got a, a good guy there now that's, well, we kind of have two two strength coaches there now. Um, the one does our track team and softball, and I don't know who else, and the other guy's more the football, um, volleyball aspect of it. Mm -hmm. So 
but uh, I I don't like all mine. Yeah, um, you I, you really can't. It's yeah. it's it's um it's not like other sports. You have a direct correlation between the weight room and throwing, and it's exactly. it's too much. For, I understand it. I mean, I understand at some level, some levels they have to give it up, but. Yeah. It, I would prefer if it, if it were me to be able to hold on to it. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's good. I you know I've I've done the whole Caldeets triphasic um, the last couple of years in some aspect of my season. You know that's something that's kind of something we've done out of Ashland when I was there, just yeah. really before it had a name to mm-hmm. it as much. Um, but did that differently this year. I actually reached out to him and. Uh, he got back to me to to contact him, but things kind of hit the fan with some family health issues, and then my wife is is pregnant with our ah, first now. So congrats! That kind of went on the the back burner as far as a lot of in depth analysis with him. Um, but uh, but yeah, we I did it differently. I don't, are you familiar with that much mm-hmm. with Caldeets' yeah. program? Yeah. So I mean, we we did it a little differently. With I did two weeks of isometric to start, mm-hmm. um, as opposed to starting with the eccentric. Um, so we did two weeks of iso, and then we're doing about a th- three weeks of eccentrics, and then we're going the concentric route. Um, but I tried to incorporate more of some contrast with it at all times. Like during our iso phase, we were doing um, isometric on deadlift bench and i want to transition into front squat but we did a split squat as our second lower and then it was superset with um low deficit jump so kind of like a Werner gunther kind of deal yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. and um that it, it went pretty well pretty happy with how that those first two weeks went i mean it's kind of hard to gauge when you're talking isometrics yeah um and then now we're on or, or five second eccentrics. Um, Build which, some uh, body weight on Yeah, and... putting some. And the, the reason I went that route going the ISO to eccentric is prior years I had done eccentric first and then done more of a um, yielding isometric as opposed to an overcoming isometric, mm-hmm. which I didn't like the percentage we had to go to. For that, um, I, I wanted more of that overload principle mm-hmm. prior to the concentric phase. And that's where I switched eccentric and isometric up. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see how it goes. I've also incorporated, like with our, our deadlift day, um, band assisted. So we're getting more top heavy yeah. Um, yeah. out of our deadlift. So it's. You know, I, I get my raw data at the beginning of the year. We did more of a rep test to see where our guys are at uh, and girls. But it'll be interesting to see because I, I kind of throw the science out the window and we max out the week before our first meet. You know, I'm more from that psychology aspect of yeah. it is, you know, you just hit them, you know, feel I'm, in the weight room. You feel like you can run through walls on meet day. You know, that's I'm with confidence. you 100%. Yeah, so it'll be interesting to see the growth with the cycle this year since I did it differently. Yeah. But I, I'm excited about it. I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be good. And I've let them have a little more fun on the upper body days. You know, we still were, were hitting our, our bench and everything, but I, I took my auxiliaries and made them more, um, as many reps as possible. Just Loving the weight room and, yeah, and getting yeah. after it a little bit. Let them have a little more fun to it. Because last year I went with more of a, for our peak cycle at the end of the year, I gave two options instead of giving them, this is your program. Because I wanted more ownership to it. Uh-huh. So all the way up until our last phase before conference, everybody was on relatively the same program. A little bit of changes in percentages and whatnot, you know, javelin throwers making modifications versus my shot putters, mm-hmm. that kind of stuff. But for my peak, I gave two options. You know, we could either ride out the heavy and build up to a, like a one rep max in, in our our cleans, or I think we were snatching at that point. We snatched for outdoor, um, and I think we were board benching. So you could either go building up to a snatch max and a board bench max, or we could go the the Ashland cluster protocol with snatches at more like sixty percent, 
one rep every 15 seconds mm -hmm. for a minute and then four minutes rest. Um, and I let them pick. Um, and I think uh, it, was, it was good for their confidence on a longer scale than just on meat day. Sure. You know, yeah. like everybody, hopefully everybody can kind of um, be confident on meat day, you know, look at your all encompassing training leading up to a moment. Um, but this was, you know, this is the program I picked for me knowing myself. Sure. Yeah. Like that makes a lot of sense. Up to it. Yeah. And I liked it a lot. And I, I still gave input prior to it because of my young ones. I said, you know, I think you should be on this, you know, my guys that needed to gain weight and my freshmen are you don't need to cluster right you know we're, we're in the long term here you still need to go heavy. let's grind a little bit next year if we decide you want to try it maybe but it was more for my my seniors and juniors who know how they perform exactly. and what makes you're, them do you're things two years yeah. deep you know this is know yourself this is look back in your notes and see hey yep. i hit my big my big marks coming off of a max versus when we're kind of down cycling a little yeah bit. So yeah it's It'll be interesting to see how how this goes with the whole triphasic. If it's something I'm gonna um, hang on to for for maybe later in the year, if not maybe next year, or yeah. later in the year. It's a little bit of experimenting can't hurt for Got sure. To do a little bit anyway. Yeah. All right, brother. I'm gonna let you get out of here so you can get back down and practice. I appreciate you coming up here and. Uh, We'll do it again, I'm sure, and yeah. uh, good luck to you this year, and uh, good luck on the new baby. And Thank you. Awesome. It. Yeah, it'll be interesting. Week after conference, it's due, so. <laughs> Hopefully it'll hold out. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <be> all right. <laughs> all right. This has been the Refined Savage. See ya.